Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sandra. I'm the editor of DenFair. Um, and I'm presenting the series of talks in conjunction with our major speaker program partner, Clipsal by Schneider Electric, just across from us. Um, today, we have a really fascinating talk uh, on design, waste, and the circular economy. And I think, uh, as a community of designers, we do have a responsibility to um, try and design our practice to um, be as responsible as possible. Um, the panel that I have here today uh, all bring something different to the table um, and we'll have a heap of enlightening things to share about this topic. Um, moderated by uh, Tamsin from Green Magazine, one of our uh, media partners. Um, thanks Tamsin for taking over the spot. And um, uh, without further ado, let's welcome the panel today. There will be time for questions afterwards as well, um, and I'll leave you to it, Tamsin. Hello, thank you all for coming. Um, by the size of the crowd, I'm assuming there's quite a bit of interest in this topic, which is great. Um, I've got a number of um, speakers here on the panel, all of which um, are doing interesting stuff and have a bit to say about how they are approaching um, a circular economy model in the work that they do. Uh, I will introduce you to them before they each speak about their work. I just wanted to uh, start off with a little bit of an intro about um, the circular economy. And uh, I'm sure you probably most, most of you understand what the circular economy, economy is, um, but basically, at the moment, and for a long time, we've all been operating pretty much in a linear cycle whereby something is produced, we consume it, and we discard it. A recycle, recycling um, system means that we produce something, we recycle it, and we dispose of it. Um, sometimes we might recycle it again. A circular system is when we produce something, hopefully from a recycled material to begin with, or uh, a raw a natural material to begin with that can be consumed and then recycled or reappropriated into something else or recycled back into the same system whereby it just goes around and around. And um, this system is something, is a system that leads to a circular economy. And um, that quote up there, I'm not sure that all of you can read it, um, but uh, William McDonough, who um, along with a colleague uh, Michael Brongard wrote a book called Cradle for Cradle in 2002, said that everything is a resource for something else. In nature, the waste of one system becomes food for another. Everything can be designed to be disassembled and safely returned to the soil as biological nutrients or reutilised as high quality materials for new products as technical nutrients, nutrients without contamination. Uh, McDonough currently works with some of the world's largest brands to help them rethink and redesign packaging which is reusable, recyclable, compostable and importantly recoverable. He says that commerce is the engine of change. A recent Victorian Parliament research paper talked about uh, half the waste we generate in Australia is being recycled. The continued growth in economic output has meant that the volume of waste going into landfill is actually on the rise. Researchers have highlighted that three billion new middle class consumers are set to enter the global market in the next 15 years, meaning that the throwaway culture in the current linear economy can only get worse if the model remains unchanged. The circular economy seeks to address these resource losses and presents a more restorative process where materials and components can be reused many times over. Advocates of the circular model have highlighted that there is also a considerable economic argument in favour of a transition to a circular economy. In Canada, the Circular Economy Leadership Coalition has noted that the current circular economy practices will lead to upwards of 4.5 trillion US dollars in economic activity by 2030 through innovation, job creation and resource shortage mitigation. Closer to home, it's been argued that the transition to a circular economy with the increased recycling such as the transi transition would entail could lead to greater employment in Australia. For example, in a submission to the Senate inquiry into the waste 
and recycling in industry, the Waste Management Association of Australia stated that for every 10,000 tonnes of waste recycled, 9.2 jobs are created. South Australian data has also revealed that some 25,000 jobs would be created over five years if waste was recycled and reused, rather than dumped and ex or exported. I've, um, I'm going to take a look at three different circular systems. <coughs> the E1500 chair by Snoheta, a Norwegian company, um, is a structural redesign of a Norwegian modernist bent wing classic, the R48, from the late 60s. The, de the uh, Snoheta designer's ambition was to shift the public attitude towards used plastic and to see it as a valuable resource. The frame is made from recycled steel. The seat is made from worn out fishnets, ropes and pipes from local farming companies. Once the plastic components are worn out, they can be collected, processed and subsequently grinded into a granule that can be injected into formwork, generating endless possi possibilities for developing new objects. The chairs are made in the same area as the fish farming companies and so the entire process creates a local circular economy. Carpet is one of the world's biggest contributors to landfill. Nyaga are a group of redesigners who are material scientists but call themselves redesigners who develop products that are fully recyclable and non-toxic. They believe that all materials used in new products should be recyclable. The Niagara carpet has been designed from scratch using non-toxic materials that can be easily separated and turned back into new carpet. They offer this technology to carpet manufacturers globally and also work, uh, do work um, with them to, and retailers to stimulate the return flow of carpet, which is an essential element of the recycling process. The Husky Cup is an Australian innovation. It has unique thermal properties that keep coffee hotter for longer. The fin design protects ha um, hands from heat. It's incredibly durable. It's been tested in cafes with high activity. But most importantly, it's made from coffee husk, a natural material that has usually discarded in high volumes in the milling of coffee. It's completely non-toxic. The company has set up a swapping system for ease of use and have closed the loop by setting up a re recollecting and repurposing repur system also. Our first speaker today on the panel is Vanessa Katsanakis. Is that right? <laughs> um, she is the director of Sussex Taps. She's a second generation um, director. Her father started the company. Vanessa works very hard um, and continues to work in regards to sustainability in the company. Um, they are a local foundry and they recycle their brass shavings amongst lots of other initiatives. Please welcome Vanessa. Thank you so much, Tamsin, for the intro. Um, for the next couple of minutes, I'd love to share a bit more about our business and what a circular economy and sustainability means to us. I've got my little clicker, here we go. Um, I think as a local maker, firstly as a local manufacturer of a product, um, all made 100% in Australia. But I think very much the foundation of our business is so intertwined with who we are today and that was I think my father being a Dutchman from the Netherlands so we all know those Northern European pianists they've just they've got it so so much so so many things right in terms of um, sustainability and just the way they purchase I've known from many trips back to family in Holland um, the way they make their purchases they're so conscious about making a, a purchase for the long term and they invest in um, in that and even from you know things that have been newly introduced here such as taking our curry bags to the supermarket that's been going on for decades in the Netherlands um, so it very much is a country that inspires us and um, is something that we look up to um, also very much something that shaped our business before I start on my four slides was the GFC and at that time there were many tap wear manufacturers in Australia and um, you know, there came a point where I think you touched on in your intro about the economics of it um, and it was something that we questioned as well, do we go offshore or do we continue doing what it is that we were doing and when I inherited my dad's business um, we had been making losses for several years 
and I think that was a result of the GFC because suddenly we were up against products that were um, much, you know, more cheaper than ours were. But I think ver it was a part of our integrity and a part of our core to be able to continue maintaining that closed loop and at any point to know where our product's from and if there's a, a bad batch, we can pull it out, melt it in our foundry 5Ks down the road, get some new brass bars out and then, you know, remake new, new, brand new components. So I think that whole experience, you know, it was only 10 years ago, but it, it very much made us leaner, smarter and, and greener. And it was a big journey, but I'm um, very happy to be on this end of it. And now we see a great appreciation over the last few years for that very fact about, um, you know, staying local and staying true to those values. Um, so at Sussex, to explain a bit about our circular economy, we're very much about a closed loop and what my dad wanted to do was to make sure that every process was in full control um, at any time. So you can see the brass shavings there, I think it's Zoran's hands holding those. And basically what that is, is once a brass bar, we can see um, a bull there with all the lining up the bars. Once they go into our machinery, our CNC machinery, a lot of the product gets shaved out of it, and that's the swarf there that you can see. Sometimes one component might have, you know, up to 80% of it machined out of it. So instead of selling that off for, you know, to a scrap value, that stays with us. It doesn't go off to another state or another country as, as a scrap product, it stays with us, 5Ks down the road, like I said, to our foundry, and at any, um, in any batch that we do, we do about 10 tonnes, and one of the blokes there is at the foundry there with all that molten metal, it's a thousand degrees, and basically all that swarf will create new bars again, ready to feed back the system. And throughout our system, we have six points of quality control, so at any point, if there's a material flaw or anything, um, we can always just remelt it down, and that's the beauty of, of, of our process and maintaining that, that level of quality. Is it just that, that one there? There we go. Okay, beautiful. So our mantra is that good design is sustainable design, and sustainability is very much at the heart of everything that we do. Even from, so we, you know, we ask ourselves, how is a product designed? Um, who is it being designed for? What, um, how will it be produced and how will it be used? And hopefully that is a, a timeless product. When we make something, we make it to last a lifetime. And um, so even from the back end, that top right-hand image there, that's a master fit that we designed uh, about a decade ago. And that doesn't even get seen. That goes behind the wall. And there are many cheaper ways that we could make that much cheaper for us. Um, however, we make it to the best possible quality, so it's leak proof, so an apprentice plumber can go and fill that up in a, um, plumb that off in a, um, a high rise. Um, it's all aligned, so we're always thinking about longevity, sustainability, and making things last and making them work from the first go. Um, so I think a great shift that we have definitely seen in, in our business has been a, an, a real embrace of that holistic approach to manufacturing and that the luxury brands um, and sustainability can go hand in hand and we've seen so much of that in fashion um, and also coming into consumer goods as well. So. Um, you know, where it once seemed impossible that luxury goods might be synonymous with sustainability, it's, it's so fantastic and, and um, inspiring for us and, you know, it makes us feel really proud that we're, that, that we're seeing this um, fantastic shift. Our last slide is about um, sustainability and, and the things that we are constantly introducing in our business. So, you know, we've been, we're very happy to have been awarded on, on through council and through state um, many uh, sustainability awards. However, for us, you know, it's never enough. <laughs> There's always more that we can do and we're always, everything that we do every day, we're always aspiring to continually improve. Um, you can see there's some solar panels, 100 kilowatts of solar panels going up on our factory, on one of our factory roofs there. And I think that's about 30% um, of our energy uh, production now. 
and we'd love to see that spread across. That's something we rolled out last year, so we'd love to see that spread across our other four factories as well. And we have our, our team up in the right-hand corner, happy bunch. <laughs> um, but, yeah, for example, there's many th things that the government has helped us with, with, um, with uh, uh, initiative towards improving our lighting and um, uh, reducing our costs. Because at the end of the day, we are, of, we are, of course, you know, businesses that need to make a profit and keep moving forward. But at the very same time, it does go hand in hand with continuing to improve ourselves. And if we are in business for the long run, which, which that's the aim, is to all these things do add up. And, you know, while there is a short term cost, they all make such great fiscal sense for the long term. And that's all from me, Tenzin. Thank you. Thanks, Vanessa. Uh, next up, we have Adele Wentridge, who is the founder and director of Fools Cap Studio. They're an independent cross-disciplinary design practice centred around built environment and interior architecture. Thanks, Adele. Thanks, Tamsin. Um, yes, um, my name's Adele. I'm an interior architect. Um, uh, I founded Fools Cap 10 years ago, so we're coming up to a decade this year um, in practice. Um, I guess, you know, um, it is a bit of a conundrum uh, with, with, um, with waste and I guess our, um, you know, what we do about waste because we are specifiers and we um, design new things generally. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a, a, a difficult, I think, and, and clearly because there's a lot of people here, um, you know, sometimes you feel like you need... Um, you know, a, a direction in which to head. I guess our, um, our approach, um, and I've put a couple of slides together, just some of our projects, um, but our approach, I mean, I think, you know, and we'll talk about it later, I think, as a panel, but, um, you know, I guess there's kind of two ways in which to look at waste in, 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 um, in our industry. And, you know, that, you know, a lot of the time uh, people talk about kind of designing for longevity. So that idea of um, something being designed really well um, and built with the right materials and obviously potentially sustainable materials that can last, last a long time and get passed down. Um, from, from generations, specifically furniture and things, the objects. But I guess, you know, that, that is um, quite a hard thing in uh, a, a, the built environment um, and in terms of, you know, churn of spaces and, and, and things like that. When you're approached by a, a client who has a... We, we work a lot in hospitality, but we also work in workplace. Um, you know, we a lot of the time we come across um, new, uh, spaces that have been there for seven years let's say, and, um, you know, and they, the client's wanting to demolish the entire space and start again because, you know, they want a new, they want a new environment. Um, so, you know, we come, we come across that quite a lot and that, um, that is a conundrum and, and what do you do about that? Um, so we, we uh, at the moment we have a project, sorry, I'll, I'll, um, I'll talk to this project first because this one's up. This is a project that we, we worked on uh, 2010, so several years ago now, um, but I put it in there. It's it's a it was a a, um, a not for profit bar called Shabeen. It was in the city of Melbourne. It's actually not doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. But um, you know, and it's it's kind of reflective of um, you know a particular style of design um, or, or or not design. Um, but a lot of the a lot of the elements in this space were actually recycled. From um, from wrecking yards and um, and all over the place, um, really, we we kind of went out there and um, and 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 tried to get uh, elements that could um, be kind of reused and recycled. And obviously, there's a definite a definite aesthetic here, um, you know. And you can't do that. You can't kind of create that environment for all of your clients. <laughs> um, but um, it was a really, it was a really kind of amazing um, process actually going through um, uh, trying to kind of see what we could reuse. And there was some absolute gold in in our search um, for for some of this stuff. And um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I guess it it kind of the outcome was this cobbled together um, kind of great little um, bar that. Um, Kind of nestled in the middle of the city, and and you know across that was the was the not for profit um, kind of aspect of it. So um, so that 
that was um, you know something that kind of we worked on and and tried to um, to reuse, I guess you know as the as the other as the other option. Um, for us is kind of this idea of reuse or um, design for disassembly. So, you know, talking to that circular economy is, um, you know, I guess as designers, um, we've got uh, a chance from, if we're designing something from scratch, to design it in a, in a fashion, um, in a system um, that can be then disassembled in a certain way and reused in, in, in different ways. So, um, this project, um, you know, in every one of our projects, we try and look at what's existing. So this was actually, this is Domaine Chandon, um, so a luxury brand, um, completely different to Shabine. Um, but, um, you know, when we, when we got to this site, we, we also kind of looked at what we could reuse from, um, from what was existing there. So um, the, some of the tables here, so they were existing tables and we re, um, restained them. Um, and some of the joinery units kind of along the edge there, um, we, we kind of re restained and reused. Um, so we, we did look at some of the furniture that we could reuse in that space as well and um, the flooring. So obviously like adaptive reuse of what's existing, um, you know, can we look at these environments with a critical eye and go, actually, that doesn't need to go into a big pit in the ground. Can we, can we kind of recycle that and reuse it? And what kind of ways can we uh, then augment that thing to, um, to kind of last a bit longer, potentially, in that, in that environment? Um, the Commons are um, a co-working space that we're working on at the moment. Um, uh, again, there was elements of this site. These are renders, so you can't see kind of what we're reusing. Um, but there are elements of the site that we're we're currently reusing um, uh, within this within this environment. Um, so some of these kind of existing spaces here on the right are um, offices that were per in perfectly good condition that we've we, we, we're just essentially kind of either reskinning or kind of reusing um, where we can. Um, this is our own space, um, the cloud, our, our own studio. Um, some of the elements in this space. So you can see there the two planters. Um, the idea of those is that um, they are kind of movable planters and um, actually what's, uh, what's forming the planter box is um, a, a, an, an ice well that um, came out of one of our projects um, for a, a restaurant um, that was a, a temporary restaurant in Sydney. And um, we use those ice wells as planters, um, but they're also used when we have functions in the space as ice wells. <laughs> um, th so they're mobile ice, ice wells that we can move around um, the space. Um, and they double as, they flip and double as a table as well. So it's kind of just being clever with, with what we can reuse. Um, so those, those elements that we're gonna be pulled out of, um, of that fit out, we, got, we, we were definitely destined for landfill and we kind of saved them and I stored them for two years and I was like, I'm going to use these at some point <laughs> and then I got to use them in our, in our own space. So um, there's also other elements that we, re we reused from other um, projects in this space as well. Um, there was another project there that didn't actually make it to the cut, but um, um, a large workplace that we're doing at the moment, um, and we are you, uh, reusing, um, we're calling it Travat, so, um, so the travertine um, on the floor um, in this workplace. Um, we're grinding it all up and using it as a terrazzo. I'm, I'm sure you've seen that kind of thing happening at the moment. Um, you know, we have tried to do that on several other projects and get waste materials to use um, in kind of a, a, as an aggregate for concrete. And um, it's a really nice, uh, a nice way to kind of reuse a material that's there on site. How do we kind of start to think about it that way? And also we're reusing um, the ceiling panels. So perforated metal ceiling panels, we're cladding um, a kiosk in that space with them. Um, so they're not kind of being thrown in the rubbish bin. So I guess just some ways, you know, I guess there's, there's the, the two schools of thought, thought and kind of worth an, uh, worth an argument as part of this panel. But, um, but yes, we, we try and do what we can. Obviously, it's, there's more to do. Thank you. Thanks, Adele. Um, our next pair of speakers are um, Karen Dargi and Dean Baird, who together run Interior. They are architects and interior designers. Um, but they also produce a beautiful um, series of door hardware from Timber Offcuts. So please welcome them. 
Thanks, everyone. Um, so just a little bit of background. I'm an architect. Um, Karen's an interior designer. Um, about seven years ago, we decided to have a crack at making products, and um, things have sort of been going quite well. But um, we were asked to talk here, and um, the question was posed, and I thought it's really interesting because it's something that we, we do inherently within the product that we create. We think about this issue. Um, but when we had to write down exactly how we deal with it, we thought, no, oh, okay, you know, like we, we had to go back and digest, you know, a lot of the reasons we make the decisions that we do and how that actually translates into um, a circular economy. So we live at the entry to the Derwent River pretty much. Um, we have a real affinity with Tasmania. Um, we love the, the place, we love being um, Tasmanian. You know, for a long time it was pretty daggy, but it's cool now apparently. <laughs> um, we also love the places that Tasmania has. And I think in terms of the product that we have, we have a deep respect for timber. Um, we realise that timber in Tasmania sometimes is, is pulled out of, um, you know, beautiful wilderness areas. Um, and we seek those sort of areas to go on holiday in as a family. And, you know, w when you understand that the product that you're using comes out of places that are photographed and used all around the world to celebrate Tasmania, it means that, you know, you, you, you need to have a respect for the product that, that you're using. Understanding our palette, um, we've put a little sort of header, I suppose, at the, at the base of some of these to sort of give an understanding of, of, of how we think about things. Understanding our palette, we think it's really important to um, get a sense of timber and, and what the product actually means and what it's achievable of, um, of doing. Timber's a great product. It's suitable for some things, not all things. Um, certain timber is suitable for certain applications, um, but it's not suitable for other applications. And, and it's important to understand what, what timber offers, what species allows you to do other things with it. The problem with misunderspecifying it or misspecifying it is that you end up with a product that's not going to have any, any form of longevity. Again, in terms of provenance, where does it come from? Um, you know, like the, these sorts of areas are where we get timbers like um, blackwood, myrtle, blackheart, sassafras, and they're sorts of timbers that we are regularly asked to make our products from, and we recognise that they do come from areas like this. So in terms of, um, you know, just natural beauty, these are some of the most incredible areas in our state. And um, the These are old-growth forests. Yeah, old-growth forests. No and doubt about it. They are thousands of years old. And generally speaking, in Tasmania now, the, the, the forestry practices have improved over the years and they're probably in a better position now than they've ever been. Um, but, you know, logging in these areas still does occur, but it's selective logging, so they'll cut down selective trees within areas and work out how they can get into those areas to take down one tree um, without actually destroying the rest of the forest in order to do that. And we ask you to take away that image to understand that when you specify timber, this is where it comes from. <laughs> not always. No, not always, oh. but... But I think <laughs> what, what's important to understand is that a lot of the time it does come from places like this. Very rarely um, does it actually come from co uh, coops that are farmed. Very rarely. And again, um, you know, this image I suppose shows you that, you know, that this is hydro wood, um, which, you know, some people may be familiar with, but it's a really interesting operation. But in terms of the area that it's in, again, it's a wilderness area. Um, so, you know, it's, they're just fantastic places. One of the things that we've sort of tried to do in our practice is to make sure that, um, you know, that notion of waste, not what not, we, we really look at how we can reduce waste. Um, and importantly for us, that has come down a lot to understanding how we can get the product that we need to make our own products. Um, setting up relationship with suppliers who understand exactly what you want and what's suitable for your product to be made from um, has been key to our business. Uh, for a while, when we, were, when we first started out, um, we relied upon people that, that weren't familiar with our product and didn't really know what we were after. And quite regularly we were um, delivered timber that wasn't suitable for the purpose that we required it for. 
And um, so over time we've developed processes to allow people to understand exactly what sort of timber we need, what are the, the um, attributes of the timber, and um, we've also developed a relationship with suppliers who now we don't have to tell them what it is we're after because they understand what we're looking for. And that's, that's really, really important in terms of creating the best product. If we have a substandard piece of timber, we can only make a substandard product. Um, we really need to get timber that is fit for purpose. And again, that's hydro wood. Interesting enough, black heart sassafras is available through um, hydro wood, but the tannins in the water stain the timber a, a slight greenish colour. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting. Something from nothing. Um, what we've found really interesting in the journey is that we've been really, really surprised by what people throw away. Um, it's, it, it's amazing what's thrown away, and it's amazing what you can do from it. Um, I would say that there's possibly no product, no single product that we make that we can't um, make from timber that someone would throw away. Um, there's no, no piece uh, that's large enough that we've ever made that we couldn't make from waste. Um, in Tasmania there's, there's a, a, a terrible sort of thing where waste timber, particularly in, in um, you know, t timber yards or joinery shops, uh, there'll be boxes of timber left at the end of the day, and what do they do with them? Um, they take them and burn them. People start their fires with them, and these are usable pieces of timber um, that people that are clever and don't rely on large sections can, can make things from. Um, so, and I, I, mean, I, I was really surprised to find out exactly the quantum um, that we can source via this method. One of the other key elements, I suppose, is we, we've sort of adopted the fact that we should never throw away the waste timber or the, or the offcuts of timber that we produce because we might always come up with, a, with another use for it. And over the years, we've found that our products have increasingly gone from what we thought originally were large handles to larger and larger and larger. Um, and what that means is that when you're cutting circles from a, from a, a plank, um, that you're starting to get these sort of triangulated sections of waste timber. And we've found that those timbers are becoming useful for us to create smaller and smaller products. Um, so in the seven years, we've sort of ended up with a shed that's probably about 1.2 metres wide by about um, two and a half metres long. And we've got a pile of timber in it that's less than a metre high. Um, and we, we quite regularly find uses for those little bits and pieces. This is one that sort of goes against the grain of what really what's happening at the moment, um, I suppose, in Australia and worldwide, is that we've really sought out makers to make things for us. We feel that the, the human eye and the human hand is something that um, is really key to our product. Um, a person can understand and look at a board and they can make the most of it. They can maximise the available product um, that, that you can get from that one piece. If we used a machine, and we've done this as an experiment, um, a machine doesn't have the same understanding or feel and you tend to get a lot more waste. You might get 30% more waste than what you would get if you use a person to make it. Obviously using a person, the economy of scale and the speed is lost, um, but you get um, better efficiency in terms of the usability of the material. We also have decided in terms of our business setup that cost is key. Um, it's never been something for us to undervalue our product. Our product is, we've never thought it's cheap. We know, we know where it sits in the market. And we've decided that it's important to put a real dollar value on it because if we have something that's relatively, you know, it's worth something, um, then people are less likely to throw it away. Um, if you have something that's, that's clearly at a very low cost point and the product fails or the product isn't fit for purpose, after a while it outlives its, its usable life and it's thrown away. If the product's more expensive, that sort of mentality of throwing away um, tends to disappear. Um, our business is also not set up for, um, for uh, growth. Uh, we would prefer it to be sustainable. Um, we don't seek 
um, huge growth and huge profits. In fact, um, we probably are anti-profit. Um, we invest heavily in, in our people and, um, and, and we're very lucky to, to have them. So yeah, we've got a slightly different economic model. We try and, um, we've learned a lot. Um, you know, as an architect that worked for 15 years or so, I thought I knew a lot about timber, but I, I sort of became quite aware that I knew very little about it. And seven years later, I know quite a lot about it now in terms of specifying it. And we really try and help our specifiers to specify the right product. It's good for us. Um, if our product lasts a long time, it's good for an architect or an interior designer to have a product that's fit for purpose and doesn't give their clients any problems. And um, it's, it's good in terms of longevity of the product. So pick our brains. <laughs> And the other thing is, in terms of timber, timber, the key thing about timber is timber has to be maintained. Um, if you make the maintenance on timber difficult, then it won't be maintained and the life will be lessened. If you um, use a product or use a system that allows it to be um, maintained easily, then you'll get a prolonged life. Tailor-made, we also think that it's important to make to order. Uh, we've never really been people that have decided to make large quantities of stuff and have them for sale. Um, we think that people that can specify and get exactly what they want, that they, they tend to be wed to that product. They want something specifically and we try to give them that specific thing. Um, we've never sort of strived for that, you know, near enough is close enough. So someone, oh, it wasn't really what I wanted, but it was close, you know, because there, there's not the emotional connection with the product then. Sorry, I just have to read my notes very quickly. That was um, a project done in Hobart by Ben Small K. And um, the handles on the left are actually um, an adaptation of one of our O rings. Um, they wanted something that was surface mounted. Um, and we created that's Beck um, walking through the doorway. And she has a little dog called Alan. Um, hashtag O Alan. Uh, so you can see the O Alan specifically for that project at surface mounted um, to reflect our O rings um, on some adjacent joinery. And deliberately our products are always made for low volume production. We never thought of doing the mass production and to be honest it's something that really doesn't interest either of us. Um, we've really tried to keep the scale small so that's manageable in terms of people make it so therefore people can only make so many in a day. Um, and we try to make it so that it's sustainable in terms of the, the wood turners, they don't die <laughs> because we're overworking them. Um, and also in terms of timber, what's really interesting, we worked on a project um, probably a couple of years ago now and it used a lot of black butt. And you, when you think of timber, you think that it's this never ending resource. But what we found interesting in the project was that the black butt stocks in Australia to service this one project had almost exhausted the, the supply Australia wide. Um, so it's important to remember that when you specify things such as timber, um, that it's not a never-ending supply and that there is a finite amount and when we have to replace it, there's considerable time invested into regrowing it. And again, the, the idea of sustainable pace, you know, so slow and steady wins the race. Um, we also have considered packing. And to be honest, packing, I, I've often read on Instagram and, and a lot of people say, you know, it's the most fulfilling time of their life to pack their product and send it. It's actually the thing I hate the most. <laughs> Just to pack all day is actually really boring and you find that it either doesn't quite fit or it's too big. And, um, but we, um, you know, we, we, we try to use cardboard, um, expandable paper, um, so that these products can be recycled at the end of the day. I'm going to add something to that before you disappear, Dean. Um, really interesting, put the other hat on as an interior designer. Um, on one of your projects, ask them to save all the packaging that comes from products that, um, being shipped into the project um, and have a look at the end of the day. You'd be very surprised at how much you collect. And at the end of, um, I mean, our products, we, we, we would like to think that they outlive their owners in some ways, but, um, you know, that's not always the case. But um, we make them removable so that they can be transferred. A lot of people take them onto their new dwellings, new houses, um, new apartments, new commercial fit-outs. Um, and we like to think that the products go with people, are, are repurposed. 
um, and we try to make them so that that, that option is available. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to move on to some quick um, questions for the panel before I open up to questions to the, to the audience. Um, I'm sure you've got many and you might be able to answer some of my questions. Um, we touched on um, packaging then. I mean, this is obviously a very big problem. Uh, how do we deal with that? And I know that there um, is legislation in, in coming into some air countries that um, demand that the companies that produce their, these goods package them in a way that can in a, uh, be recycled or returned to them to deal with rather than um, us dealing with them. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else to add to that question from anyone, but... Um, Never yeah. underestimate your power as, as specifiers. Um, we're all listening to you. We take um, your needs very seriously. Um, push the ante. Um, ask for better packaging. Ask for the things that you, you want and that you think are important. Um, we'll always listen and I know that other product suppliers will. Um, but it, it does need to be pushed. Yep. I'm just going to add something. <laughs> um, I think also, I mean, w I work a lot in hospitality. I think, um, you know, definitely the packaging on site is a huge problem. How can we, how can we, I mean, we, and we talked about, you know, is there a database that that could go to that then could, other people could use to package their, their products in? That would be pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, also, I think in, in hospitality, there's a, there, there, there is a huge kind of, um, we could make some giant leaps um, if um, packaging to hospitality environments changed. Um, you know, um, Yoast started um, working on that project um, brothel in the city, which was, you know, basically everything that came to site um, came in containers that they reused. Um, I think that that, you know, obviously on a massive scale, um, there's something there that could happen. Um, and, and including in talking specifically about waste, you know, how do you start to reuse the waste from, from those environments? I'm talking about organic waste, um, biodiesel generators, things like that to power the buildings. Um, there, there are, that technology exists and it's really readily available. So, um, you know, waste can be used in so many ways. It's, um, it's packaging, it's packaging coming in, it's packaging going out, but it's also the waste that we generate as human beings in those environments that we're kind of very unaware of. Mm. Yes, Yost Backer, if you um, aren't aware of him, I'm sure most of you are, is uh, ahead of his time as far as um, coming up with innovative ways to reduce waste. In fact, he has his most recent project is a um, recycling plant where in Mombok where he's re recycling all the local waste, which is quite incredible for a man that is also um, a florist and a food hero. <laughs> um, we, we also, Dean, you also touched on this topic a bit. How can we turn waste um, streams into positive economic systems so that they're considered a valuable resource? Um, and, th and then the other question is this is, what about people who can't afford to buy high-end design? What, what about those people that can't afford the really well-made, really long-lasting pieces? How do we deal with that? I think the, the, the first question is a really interesting one, and I'll sort of answer it by um, giving an example. One of the timber supplies that we use, uh, they create an enormous amount of waste, you know, sawdust, um, off cuts of timber. And a number of years ago, uh, things were a little bit different, you know, and a lot of the waste was taken away to commercial laundries and they were using them to fire the boilers to, to operate the laundries. Um, now that's all turned to gas now and they don't know what to do with their waste. And it's not necessarily because they're, they're not clever. They're very clever in the industry that they work within. They're clever at creating um, a timber product. Um, but when you step a little bit outside of the circle that they're very familiar with, they suddenly become very unfamiliar with it. And they're generating large amounts of waste and they don't know what, you know, how to utilise that waste. And I, I suppose from our perspective, I, I saw it as a good business opportunity for a strategic thinker to understand how to deal with it and what the options are because they're generating large volumes and whatever they do with it is going to cost a considerable amount of money. Um, 
but they need some certainty and they need someone that's very strategic and lateral in their thinking as to how they might go about dealing with it. And I don't think that those people necessarily exist at the moment. Um, I think that there's a bit of a black hole as to what we do. And as a, as a consequence, what these people do is they give their waste to the tip and then the tip deals with it. So out of sight, out of mind. And the person actually said to me, I wish the day would come one day when we're not allowed to have any waste to exit our site, then we'd have to deal with it. So there is no incentive um, to stop it. That's either. right. And really, it, it should be that that one person's waste is another person's valuable material. Yep. And it will become that. And it is becoming that way in some places. And, um, it just needs to speed up. Um, we had a very interesting and quite heated dinner conversation about that question. Um, Dean used the word incentive and I think that at the moment it's all incentive based but I think the reality is that it needs to be penalty based. So no one's going to get clever until they have to pay. Um, and, and given an incentive, yeah, whatever, I might get to that. Yep. But given a penalty, yep. different story. They'll be innovative then. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, look, I might open up to the audience because we haven't got that much time and I just want to make sure we answer any other questions. Um, has anyone got a question out there that they need to ask? Otherwise, I'll go on with ours. But if anyone has a question? No? Yes? Yes? Um, we specify quite a lot of marble um, for big projects. We're trying to do that less and less. But I've been asked specifically, is marble sustainable Tracy? I don't think it is, but I just would be really interested to know how you feel. Are you asking this. Adele that question? I'm asking anyone. <laughs> anyone. <laughs> um, oh, my God. Sustainability is so complex, I tell you. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a ways and means of, of uh, extracting marble, you know, the embodied energy in, in such a product. Um, I guess going back to that argument of longevity, marble is something that, you know, it, although porous lasts a very long time, um, you know, you, you, you see, um, uh, you know, uh, um, amazing build, uh, buildings that still exist that are carved out of mar marble across the globe. Um, you know, I, I guess, you know, that, that's one of the things that we're, we're looking at in the project that I was talking about that I can't say too much about, but... Um, you know, it is a product that can be kind of broken down and then reused in different ways. So can you reuse it um, as an aggregate for something else, you know, in the, in, in the future and in the long term? Um, can you, um, how can you reuse um, that material is, that, is the question back to you. Um, but, I, you know, in terms of sustainability, I think there's, there, are, there are more sustainable uh, materials um, but there's a there's always a payoff, um, and it's it's it is a difficult question to kind of answer with a, a linear response. But I think you know if we, if you put it into the category of um, longevity, then maybe um, maybe you can justify it. It's very hard to grow a mountain; it takes a long time. I'd say no. <laughs> non, -renew non renewable. Yeah, I mean, what I, one thing that we found is we're dealing with our products and then coming back into architecture and translating what we've learnt in our products through to our architectural work is that we've started to really limit our palette um, and we've started to pay a lot more emphasis on understanding our palette. So the material palette that we use isn't as broad. Um, the materials that we use we understand better and we look for different things. Um, I think that, you know, that uh, we're not necessarily trying to look for things that are fashionable or create a certain look we're starting to look more for things which are fit for purpose and are going to serve the client or the user for the, you know, for a, 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 an extended amount of time with, with minimum fuss. And I think that that really does lead you to certain um, conclusions. Which takes us back to the whole idea of a circular economy or a circular system. In, if building materials are made from recyclable materials and there's a great system set up, then it's not going to become as much of an issue. Um, and, you know, Adele can go onto a site and either reuse what's there or send it off to the right recycling facility to be recycled well into this, another product or the same product. And, and so then we won't have this problem. Um, and I think that pretty much sums it up. Does anyone else have any questions? Yes? I have a question for Adele. Um, you had mentioned in one of your, in your presentation that on, in a workplace project you're recycling 
um, travertine and converting into terrazzo. Um, one of the things that projects going to cite is value management. So how does your client react to that? Because crushing t travertine into terrazzo is more expensive than buying a straight terrazzo tile. Love that question. Thank you. <laughs> um, we, we have discussed, we kind of met and discussed this as a group as well, and it was, it's one huge thing that, um, that is a massive problem in, I guess, um, the, education of, the education of our clients. Um, and, um, you know, luckily enough, um, this, this client has a, we have a, we have a large budget, <laughs> you know, but um, not all of, all of our projects um, have those those kinds of budgets, and it does come down to um, yeah, there, there is a there is a massive issue that we we walk on to a lot of sites and we approach we have this approach in in, in most of our um, projects, and at the end of the day, it comes back to the builder coming back to us and saying, oh, it's it's more expensive to do it that way. Let's demolish it and put it into the ground, you know. And um, I don't. I don't have a really clear sense of how to proceed on that, but I do think, you know, I don't think necessarily that um, it it all has to be altruistic. I think that it can come back to um, how your client wants to communicate that to the world, you know, and um, and sometimes they want to communicate that more than something else, and. Um, and potentially that's a, a kind of a, at least one step forward or one step closer to kind of making it, educating everyone around that. I was speaking to a builder um, yesterday actually um, and I asked him um, why is everything so expensive? Um, <laughs> a loaded question. Um, building, I, I've noticed, is getting so much more expensive and he said, you know, um, it's, it's materials, um, you know, every single material is getting more expensive and labour, of course, um, but also people's tastes are getting more expensive. You know, we, um, we design is a vernacular that everyone talks about now. Um, everyone um, sees on Pinterest, everyone sees, you know, we have access to it more. Um, so everyone's like, well, I want that, you know, and it is, we can, you know, it's, somewhat get that if, if we have the budget. But, um, you know, I, I think maybe we need to start pairing that back a little bit. <laughs> um, that we need to start challenging, um, you know, our, our clients on those, on those things, potentially. I don't know if that answers your question very well, but it, it is, um, it's a challenge. I think um, that converting things into other things is generally more expensive. Um, you know, the, 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 the tra travazzo that we're, wor that we're working on has to go off site and come back on site. So, I mean, how sustainable is that really? <laughs> but at least that material is not going into the ground. I don't know, um, there's, a pa there's a payoff somewhere. And I guess the hope is that um, these materials that or, pr uh, pro or products that are being specified are ones that are, they may be more expensive, but they are definitely more durable and they are more loved and hopefully therefore last a lot longer in place. Yeah. I think, I think sorry, just back on that as well. I think um, as designers and I was talking about this kind of, I guess, before, is that design for disassembly. So if we can, can design that in at the beginning so that those things are easily pulled apart and reused, um, I think that is where we can make the biggest impact, you know, so that then in the future, when you go to site, that thing is easily, easily pulled apart and reused in a, in a different way rather than, you know, the labour associated with then reworking that, that material. We do have one more question here. Oh, yep, another question over there. Hi, um, I just wanted to go back to the affordability um, question. Um, if you're a small business and someone just can't afford all these beautiful, well-made products, um, would you, how do you handle that? Do you send the client away because you just believe that you don't want to work with him or do you find, um, I don't know, a way to save on certain things so then you can specify the really sustainable products? Like, how, where's the balance? I find it really... It's a delicate hard. balance, I think. And I, I mean, you know, it's how can you say to someone, I mean, if you can put the economic equation to them and suggest that 
if it is possible for them to buy a very, a very beautiful, well-made piece of furniture that they really love, and they look at the, the long-term gain in that, and the and the fact that that hopefully that piece of furniture is going to be around for, t for a long time, and there's not going to be ten pieces of furniture in its place in the meantime, then then perhaps that that can be convincing. And then I guess it's a, a matter of giving give and take um, with other things. Second hand, some new things, some second hand things. Um, yeah, and make sure they're recyclable. Any other questions? No? We might wrap up then. Um, oh, we got one? No, no. Uh, I'd like to thank our panellists, Vanessa, Adele, Dean and Karen. Thank you all and thank you all for coming. Thank you to all our panellists. I'll just echo that sentiment. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say from, uh, as I was listening to the panel, realising that um, also Denfair 2, we've tried to incorporate a lot of the best practice things that we see all our exhibitors do into the way that we um, we approach the, all the installations that we make. So we've actually got, um, we've been approached and we've also approached uh, architects um, to um, invite them to take bits and pieces of the exhi exhibition that we've made specifically for these three days um, to then repurpose them. So I think this space, which is made entirely out of foam um, by uh, jo Joyce Foam Products, um, will either be used for insulation um, or I think used for other um, purposes um, down the track too. So yeah, everything you see here will be uh, integrated into that circular economy that we're... Um, I just want to say something on that too. Yeah. So. Um, I love this space. So last year they did a really similar, Joyce Foam did a really similar um, uh, uh, it, um, space. And um, basically I had contacted them <laughs> um, at the end of the exhibition because I was like, oh my God, I, wanna, I, want, I want it. I want to reuse it in, my, in our studio actually. And um, I contacted them and they had said, um, unfortunately I was a bit late um, because they, ha they had ground the foam up and they use it for ca carpet underlay and yes. insulation and yep. so it did go to a good home yeah unfortunately not my home but yeah and then I think another one of the flaws in it, the other exhibitions is, is actually going to be used as a um, repurposed for a dance school um, so things like that yeah I, I just wanted to say on behalf of the exhibition too that we do try and uh, implement those things <laughs> thank you so much to our panel today we all give them a big round of applause